Hey everybody, I'm John Rourke, Editor-in-Chief of Phoenix Home and Garden Magazine, and we're here in the Tempe studio of fine artist Jeffrey Gersten. Hey Jeffrey. Hey, howdy. Hi, so Thanks we, um, Jeffrey is featured in our uh, uh, August, September issue, and um, there were many things about you that kind of surprised me, and one of the first ones was that you're self-taught. Yeah, it seems like an accident that <laughs> happened all of its own accord, because I like to th think back and just realize that I didn't know how bad I was. I thought I was doing pretty good when I was actually horrible. Right. So if I had ever known, if anyone had pointed that out, I definitely would have quit, and that would have been the end of it. So thankfully, I was too naive to realize that. And, and no I got, one pointed it out. Yeah, because young artists, sometimes they talk to me about this stage they're in, and they just can't get through it. It's like, exactly. a, like they're running into a, a wall, the metaphorical wall, and they're never going to get through it. And I'm like, I remember that, but I didn't know it was a wall. I was just like, I guess I climbed over it somehow eventually. <laughs> and so you were a creative kid. Um, I know when we talked before, you talked about how you would get in trouble um, doodling on your homework. Yeah. So, uh, so talk about that, how you had this kind of creative energy, but didn't really know what to do with it. Yeah, that was confusing because there was so much of an impulse to make something. And so, but I didn't know what to make or why really, or... So at one point I was fabricating armor and crossbows and stuff. And I would find uh, on Google uh, like documents, um, this is such a weird segue, but uh, <laughs> at, at, in high school when the internet was fairly new, I found scanned in manuscripts and I would print them out and take them home and build like uh, medieval objects from the original manuscripts. And I made a crossbow that was really cool, like by hand. So I was always making stuff <laughs> And then, then I became more creative. I started drumming, and then I became rebellious and started skateboarding, and then I just looked like a typical rebellious teenager. But I had this impulse still all that time to like make something meaningful, and it felt very emotional then. I remember being incredibly emotional about it, which might have just been that I was a teenager. But um, once I finally saw a painting, then I realized I wanted to do that, and I just started. And tried. <laughs> and so if I recall correctly, you, the painting that you saw was in an encyclopedia. Yeah, okay. yeah, that that was an etching. Um, yeah, that I, I it was an accidental discovery that I, I just saw the, uh, the, it, a, an etching of lines that looked like a drafting drawing that had uh, been shuffled or scrambled and the lines moved over each other in a way that mechanically no longer made any sense, but it was so beautiful, the arrangement, almost accidental that this is when I finally saw something that prompted me to try to draw. And, and it's such such a random thing that happened. Yeah, it, it might have been something that was trying to happen, <laughs> right? trying to get out, and it, and it finally did then. So it was definitely seemed random at the time, but I think at some point it, it might have occurred to me, or maybe not, but, um, but I, I didn't know anything about painting or drawing then. I just loved, uh, at, at that moment, it was abstract, so I wanted to be an abstract artist, so that's what I tried to do. Okay. I should probably mention that the third member of our party is Mr. Puff. Yeah, Mr. Puff um, is so here. So he is, uh, is kind of your student st studio assistant and, yeah. and ever-present sidekick, and tell me again his, his full name. Oh, his name is Giorgio Vasari, which is uh, named after the, uh, the, the Italian writer who st was a contemporary of the great Renaissance painters and sculptors, so he started um, documenting what he was seeing as he 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 said this inspired movement of a uh, so, uh, around all around him and he inadvertently created the genre of um art history by oh, okay. just writing about what he saw it became a, a historical document about the most famous art or important artists throughout wor you know, human history so anyway Giorgio's just sort of an apprentice level still <laughs> to all that <laughs> right exactly yeah. um so Okay, so you started, once you started painting and you just kind of taught yourself how to do it, um, what were those first paintings that you did? They were, they were mostly dark-ish, dark palette, very surreal. And you were attracted to like the Dutch masters and mm -hmm. the, uh, the Dutch and the, what was the other? Uh, may, maybe uh, uh, Flemish. Yes, yes, Flemish yes, yes. And Dutch, okay. yeah. Right. So the the uh, later on I added Danish because there's, okay. there's but it's a little more uh, Euro eurocentric kind of soft vibe to the painting, but very very exquisite I think in the the painterly touch. But um, 
So, but the, the Dutch were so good at painting dark scenes, yes. ten tenebrism and uh, the sort of like shiny objects emerging from the blackness because, you know, people didn't have electricity then. So they, they were really observing a sort of a, a sort of halftone dimness inside of every like domicile they were in, which, which, which is illustrated in the painting style. And so... And I, I was very inspired by that sort of rendering aspect of uh, of pulling something from the from the shadows. Okay, and so you would just use these kind of as reference and kind of taught yourself. You just like zoom in or whatever and say, okay, this is how you figured out how they did it, right? Yeah, well, it's like you, I stared at painting so much in books, like uh, say a Dutch still life, that I saw sometimes an accidental discovery I would make is when say I, I wiped paint over uh, an already finished painting, wet over dry, and I smudged it, and I realized that looks like a glaze that I saw in like a Dutch painting. And I'm looking closer at the Dutch paintings, and you see the whole thing is glazed all over. There's like right. rubbed pigment everywhere, where the, the wiping removes the top layer of pigment, but it gets pushed down into like the tooth of the canvas. So there's this granular film-like effect of, right. a, of a tone, tone tonality. And I was like, well, I just discovered that by accident just from staring at this for so well, long. And they probably discovered it by accident as well. Yeah, that this kind is how, a you're, way. you're right, you're right, because right. oil painting was so new then. Yeah, right. that, yeah, so. Okay, and so the, the earlier paintings that you did, once you find, started to find com uh, success commercially, it was kind of like your whimsical stage, is that correct? Yeah, they were okay. much more playful. Uh, okay. Lots of animals and sort of almost like cartoonish figures, and um, there, were, there was a kind of softness to it, like a, a, a lightness um, to the, the 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 purpose, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, but in a, in that period of time, which which was going to change eventually, it just uh, had to over time. It was part of that, and how part of that evolution? How how many years ago was that? Because you're still oh. a young man, and you have you've you've been painting for what 20 years. Something uh, like that? To something like 13, 14. 13, okay. Yeah, years of painting. Right. Um, uh, Giorgio Vasari, the historian, <laughs> is back. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, they were still surreal, and then they sort of transitioned into being surreal and playful. So it was kind okay. of somewhere between whimsical fantasy, but, but then eventually it wasn't serious enough anymore, so it just like migrated entirely onward. Okay. Um, so the funny thing is that what I'm doing now is almost more similar to what I was doing when I first started painting. Oh, that is interesting. Like I made this little 10 year journey to come back to the, almost the same place, but right. I just learned how to paint a lot better. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, and it's good to know that that early stuff had a purpose, not only yeah. teaching you your craft, but now it's, it's coming back around. So yeah. talk about the day you were in New York and you happened to wander into the Met and there was a exhibit of Irving Penn. Irving photos. Penn, okay. yeah. So I, I had never seen anything like, I, I didn't like photography, I wasn't attracted to it. Um, it was just not something I had ever noticed. And this is coming from somebody who didn't go to art school. So I would have been forced to learn at least something about it then. But right. so uh, I'm just as a total like objective observer walking through the world and picking up little bits of art history. And then I happened to be in New York one time and then i went to the met just because i wanted to see the met and then there was a traveling like li like limited period of time exhibition of the irving penn photographs and they were like massive original black and white pictures and then i saw again i'm seeing tenebrism i'm seeing dutch painting right i'm seeing this In light effect medium. yeah totally right. different medium and different period of time right. like the people being depicted are now in the 1910s and 20s and 30s instead of like the Dutch figures with their strange costume and, and armor and you know the night watchmen and stuff like that so it was like the tenebrism was now being applied to something that wasn't 400 years old it was Americana in a way and that that was very very significant I think for me to I'm grateful that I was accidentally introduced to at least the idea in that way and interrupt you to find tenebrism because that was a term that I wasn't familiar with before oh, I met you. It's something like the mispronounced term uh, chiaroscuro. It's a it's okay so like in Dutch painting you see like a very very dark setting like a yes. blackish sort of plane gotcha. right. and then there are objects which have like glinting highlights on them like a glass goblet okay. and okay. so it's the sort of like Im using 
tone or using light to make an object emerge from the blackness. Okay. Which you can imagine, as I mentioned earlier about the, the candle lighting, that's how people looked. Right. Like, say at 10 p.m., someone walks into the room and it's kind of fuzzy and then you see their face slowly emerge into the right. candlelight. Right. That's tenebrism. Okay. So they were painting that, that look. Okay. So time stops, you see the Irving Penn images and you think, I need to paint realism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, you wanted to do it in black and white. Yeah. Okay. No more whimsical painting. It's over. Okay. And so the whimsical ones were pretty colorful and fun. And, and then you did this about face and, mm -hmm. and went for the photorealism, which is, I would think, a very difficult, not medium, but different, difficult uh, genre to, to go into. I mean, you have to be so focused on such minutia. But um, so you start doing the, the photorealistic black and white paintings and um, there's to just about all of your work as far as I'm aware um, there's a that throwback quality that um, mm -hmm. that kind of you're attracted to that retro that kind of from what like the 1900s through the 1950s or something like that yeah the, uh, more recently it's maybe like early 40s it's unfortunately narrowed to mid-century Americana because I was okay. trying so hard to include the 20s and 30s but it's like <laughs> It's just a little too ancient looking, like the um, the dilapidated wooden structures and the strange dresses and the sort of weird oh, carriage looking okay. cars. Right. It's still just a little like Dutch primitive. Right. And then you just get to 44 and all of a sudden there's like a, a really cool looking Ford. Right, exactly. Park, and, it, and, and the clothing is different, the style is different. There's a sort of a, this emergence of like a, a jubilant Americana, I think in the period oh, okay. of time too. World War II was just about to end, even though nobody knew it at the time in right. 44. It's right. easy to say now. But <laughs> that was a, a real like economic boom in America, which, which translated into the commercial aspect of, of American, like the appearance of America, like the billboards, the right. branding, right. the cars, the, the new houses. Um, this was part of the boom that came about as a result of like basically ar armament production. Exactly. You know, exactly. <laughs> fighting World War, so <laughs> ironic, but... Um, but s suddenly people just look different. Interesting. When you look at the photos of their faces, something about it is just different. It's very attractive. That's, yeah, that's so interesting. I was going to ask where, like, where did that come from for you that you respond to that, that specific era? Um, I, yeah, I, th I think when I see like a photo of a, a neighborhood from 1950, let's say, there's a car in the driveway there's like the cute little shades in the window. There's a nifty little yard and it's a single story house. There's something so like almost childlike yearning for this, what feels like quintessential peacefulness, like a sort of stitched up life that's, that's like contained within this unit or where you could go home comfortably and be there as a child. And it's weird to talk about it as from a child's perspective or something, but like, there was a there was a kind of magic to it that uh, you don't see in anything else. Like again, if you look at the photo from 1900, it's a pretty cool like barn shack. Sure. But it's not like <laughs> I want to go sleep in there. You know, it's not. You know, like it's a cool like 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 rustic picture. But right. like that, uh, there's something about that neighborhood that appeals to me in uh, in a sort of like a deep way. I, that's not really easy to describe but i think it's just something about the it's like that idyllic idyllic moment in time or mm -hmm. period of time and so people who collect your work obviously respond to that same type of um aesthetic so is there is there any commonality between that you see from people who who love your work um more and more that i think that that period of time things from that period of time are becoming really important because the world's moving you know, the world, so to speak, is moving too quickly or society moves too fast now. Um, we have social media making everything happen at lightning speeds and people aren't living inside their own head anymore. They're living and they're in too many places at once psychologically. And so when you see a cool picture of like Frank Lloyd Wright architecture from 1961, it looks like everyone there doesn't have a phone. And that one aspect alone <laughs> means they're experiencing the world as it was right, right then in, in, in a local sense. Exactly. Yeah. 
and um, like so they were experiencing the cool buildings and the cool cars and their life was uh, I I psychologically simpler um, even though they were still deep people who had deep thoughts but I mean they weren't ironically we're we're much more shallow because of the internet and because of social media generally speaking like and not just social media but the, the way that news spreads through social media it's like it's like a falling on a cactus every few minutes there's like spines poking you everywhere and you can't right. rest and um i i think when say somebody from slightly different era than mine remembers like they can remember being on a street like that in in the in the 60s right. as a child exactly and it, it's a little piece of that that they can reclaim and and so that then they collect the work or they buy it okay. and then other people they never experience it they're the same age as i am right and they're just like this is fun it right. is there's something about it that's so yeah. much more fun okay and so you you had your photorealistic black and white phase and then, am I correct that then you started incorporating color into those canvases? Oh yeah, I know. So as much as I loved the black and white, once I did like 20 black and white paintings in a row, <laughs> everything was very gray. Right. <laughs> you know, so then I, I started just, I w because I had my whimsical paintings were so colorful. It was like unmixed color straight out of the tube. Like just bright blues, bright yellows, pink, right. purple, whatever. Um, so I wanted to reintroduce the aspect of color along with the black and white and the way I figured out how to do it was by isolating a figure so like you know just cutting out this cowgirl and and putting polka dots behind her instead of just the girl in in the original photo I have um, is a medium format negative she's sitting on on a desk in a in a hotel lobby and it's very dimly lit and there's a, like a bright bulb behind her like a photography bulb and it's an interesting photo but it's a dreary setting. It's like right. a kind of a gross looking motel. But she's <laughs> like a, a real, she's a doll. So I put, I took the seriousness of, of the vintage black and white and I just combined it with like whimsical color. So in that way, I get a little bit of whimsical still because I couldn't, I guess I couldn't live without it in the end. Right, <laughs> right, that's a good point. Yeah, it's like the next evolution of the whimsical part of you. Yeah, they, they it came back, sort of like an infinity yeah. symbol. It just keeps on mixing together. Exactly, <laughs> in, different, in different incarnations. Um, okay, and so then I believe you started incorporating text into your canvases. Is that oh, what happened yeah. next? Yeah, yeah. I don't know how that happened or where it came from, but it was like, it felt natural that I wanted them to say something and I wanted it to be literal. Um, and I noticed how when I saw street art, at the time, you know, uh, what was it? Very early on, before Shepherd Ferry was very big, very well known, I was walking or driving through Tempe on, on, on Rural, which is local, but, you know, anyone knows who that is, um, near ASU. And my, all those buildings are now gone. They're all demolished and turned into, like, you know, n beautiful, strange alien <laughs> sculptures. Um, but all of a sudden, everything was covered on that street. With, um, with the Obey poster, and it was very startling and striking to me because I, I wasn't seeing an image, I was seeing a word. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I found out, I'm telling you, it was years later, I didn't even know. I said, have you ever seen that, that poster that says Obey? And people are like, you're talking about Shepherd Ferry? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how like, not in the art world I've always right, been. Right. I had no freaking idea. But what I remember <laughs> so much more cleanly and beautifully was the effect of seeing that was was startling and it was shocking and i think from that moment i always thought i, I remember the power of the word being used as a piece of artwork not at, not as an advertisement or not as like s script in some other format but say a painting is an oil painting on canvas it's supposed to depict a picture but i'm not depicting pictures anymore i'm just combining all kinds of things so why can't i oil paint an actual text or script that's very ironic because it's like I'm, I'm painting with Dutch oil, you right. know, Dutch pigment, but I'm painting a word, which is like an Americana thing. Like, exactly. you know, in the, again, when you see in the 50s, all of a sudden billboards emerge with like gigantic text on them. Right. And so all these motifs just kept re resurfacing. And so I started just adding them in like. I'll just see w what does the painting say if I li put literal words on it. And, uh, and, uh, um, and you, there's plenty of examples here in the studio that we'll, we'll show as well with, with the text on there. 
And um, one, of, one of your big breakthrough paintings you had told me was, and I believe it was called, It Was All a it Dream. It Was All a Dream. And so it was a, a, like a Marlboro ad that you used as inspiration? Yeah. Okay. And then why, why was that painting so important? Um, I, it was like a burning passion. I wanted to do it so badly. I wanted it to say it was all a dream. I loved the image of the sort of romantic cowboy galloping through the scene, not looking at you, not paying any attention to you, but, but you're just like looking at it as an observer. And it's very, very romantic and, and beautiful imagery. Um, and then I just wanted so badly to put text on there. And I finally just did it. <laughs> And, and I always tell people that's my most, the most honest painting I ever made was because I did exactly what I wanted to do despite the fact that when you take it to a gallery, because I'm a contemporary working artist, right. take it to a gallery, they're going to go, why does it have a word on it? Why does it have words across it? If you just paint the picture as a picture, right. it, we can sell it to somebody. But now it has words on it. That's weird. And it's like, well, okay, I'm weird. <laughs> and I made this picture. Okay. <laughs> Can you just please try? <laughs> and it worked. Yeah, it worked. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, that kicked off a whole a whole suite of paintings because um, in the gallery when they hung it, it was it was the most appealing thing. Like it was hung on the back wall of a very large gallery space opposite the front windows, the main windows, and people would walk by um, and then come back. You would see them always go past and then come back and go through the door, and they would just walk up and stay, stay s stuck there. Yeah, frozen. Yeah. So now, as far as, do you know what the next phase in your evolution is? Yeah, I'm going back to January. Um, we're here in Scottsdale. Yes. So, I mean, we have original uh, Route, Route 66 objects, icons, motels still standing, signage, old and dilapidated, but it's still clinging to life. Sure. That stuff was there right. in like 61, 59, 55-ish maybe. But, like, this is the land of Americana mid-century, if right. nothing else is. Um, and there, there's so many, like, the single-story uh, ranch-style housing. I mean, we have so much. We have Frank Lloyd Wright. So in January uh, at Altamira in Scottsdale, I'm going back to the, my, well, I almost said roots, but I don't know what my roots <laughs> are. Someone's roots. I'm going back to somebody <laughs> else's roots, and I'm going to do uh, Americana mid-century black and white again. So you're another doing a, show. Uh, another a one-man show at Altamira Fine yeah. Art in Scottsdale in January. In January, uh, January 11th. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's exciting. For so us we'll, we'll see between now and then what I come up with. That which, uh, and you just reminded me. One of the other things that surprised me about you is how prolific you are. I think you told me you can do like ten, up to ten, or maybe it was even more sizable canvases per month is it do i have yeah. that correct it, yeah it's 10 a month um it's just an obsession and it, it's like uh it, i love this churchill quote uh because he loved to paint and the thing is he's so brilliant i think is strangely brilliant person that um he wrote so many gigantic massive history books whereas like i heard of a quote uh, well, this is like a rabbit hole but i heard a comparison to co imagine how politicians today they, they have their biography is their one thing they ever published, and they have a ghostwriter. Right. Churchill was like writing like intense, like like substantive histories of the British Empire, et cetera. Anyway, meanwhile, when he goes, when he takes a break and he goes on vacation, he literally takes canvas and brushes with him, and he oil paints the scenes. So when he's on vacation, he's not watching Netflix. He's not chilling. Right. His relaxation right. is painting. <laughs> right. And that's something I can barely even figure out. So I can't even touch the like level of this kind of you know, savant brilliance. But he said, when I get to heaven, I plan on spending my first uh, 1,000 years getting to the bottom of oil painting. And it, that's a really brilliant thing to say. <laughs> I thought, if you could ever sum up oil painting, that is the one thing that sums it all up. Because it's hard to figure out. It takes an entire lifetime, and there's not enough time in a lifetime to figure it out. And you don't know how much time you have left to, to try. So sure. every painting I want to do, I want to do it ho not like fast as in technically quick, but I want to see what it looks like when it's done. Right. So, like, I, I want it to be beautiful, and I want it to get there. So I just keep on going with it as fast as I can because I want to. I want to see what it's going to look like. As simple as that. And then I want to do so many other paintings, but I know there isn't enough time in a lifetime to do them. So, right. so I do a lot now while I can. You know, yeah. I don't know how long it's going to sure. last. Amazing. 
Um, so once again, we're talking with Jeffrey Gersten, fine artist, uh, right here in Tempe. He's repped locally by Altamira Fine Art in Scottsdale. As he mentioned, there's a show coming up in January, and he's also in our current issue, um, uh, August, September. Uh, he's profiled there, so be sure and take a look at that.